Hi, Katie. Hello. You sound uh, really miserable. I'm fine. I just can't find a comfortable position. I've... I'm trying recording from the floor because apparently the sound quality is better. We'll let listeners be the judge of that, but uh, I'm sorry to hear that you're uncomfortable. I hope that this podcast doesn't make for uncomfortable listening for everyone for the next uh, (laughs) half hour or so. I'll try my best to sound really upbeat and happy. Woo! How are you? I'm good, yeah. uh, This week really feels like the week that autumn has come to Paris. Generally a beautiful time of year to be celebrated. Um, But this year I am like weeping with happiness that summer is over. Because it's been so disturbingly hot. Yeah, I did just get out a big jumper for the first time this year and I felt quite sad about it actually, but oh well. How has your week been? Um, I was actually in London for a few days last week, which was nice. And I was hanging out with my three and a half year old nephew, who's very sweet and already knows every single country in the world and where it is on the map. Oh my and God. I know. And he rather humiliated me when we were going through all the countries, starting with the A countries. I said Antigua and he said, silly Dominic, it's Antigua and Barbuda. <laughs> oh my God. He's a genius child. I Can know, he be he our is. geography correspondent? Or fact checker if he's correcting <laughs> my countries. So Dominic's nephew, you are hired. Yeah, maybe we should start inviting him to our Monday morning meetings from next week. Okay. <laughs> Deal. It would be so chaotic. Even more than it already is. Um, talking of chaos, what have we got coming up on the show? Who are we talking to? Hopefully it won't be so chaotic. Um, this week we're going to be speaking to someone who is very good at talking about something that is actually pretty chaotic. The internet. Someone who both Katie and I have admired online for many years. And we are really happy to have finally found a reason to lure her onto the show Marie Leconte is a French Moroccan journalist based in London who will be joining us to have a discussion about the internet and what it's done to those of us who had our formative years whilst the internet itself was also forming. What has growing up with the internet done to us and how is she just so damned good at doing it? Marie Leconte will be joining us later in the show, but first, it's time for... Who has had a bad week, Katie? Uh, It's been a bad-ish week for Hungary. Basically, I think the headline news is bad for Hungary. But once you dig into the story a little bit, eh, maybe Hungary's not had such a crappy week after all. Let me explain. Uh, The headline news is that over the weekend, the EU proposed freezing about 7.5 billion euros of funding for Hungary because of bad behaviour by Viktor Orban's government. And on the face of it, that's a really big deal. Uh, As we all know by now, Hungary's government has been sliding further and further into autocracy under Orban. The courts aren't really free. The media resembles propaganda. Orban's cronies get richer and richer. Migrants and LGBTQ people face a scarier and scarier lack of protection. It is all extremely depressing. And actually, the European Parliament went so far last week as to release a report saying that Hungary shouldn't be called a democracy anymore. It's not the only EU country where it feels like democracy has been decaying. Uh, We've talked a lot on this podcast about concerns over Poland's democracy and Bulgaria as well, to some extent. And in general, this feels like it's become the EU headache of our time, or at least one of the major headaches. Like, what are we supposed to do if a country joins the EU, this club of really strong democracies, and then after it's joined the club and has voting rights, it starts becoming really repressive? This just feels like a problem that the EU has been horribly stuck on for years now. Anyway, in this context, a couple of years ago, the EU came up with a new mechanism under which, if a national government appeared to be undermining its own democracy, the EU could block that government from receiving EU money. Uh, It's called the rule of law mechanism. I kind of hate the expression rule of law because a lot of people don't really know what it means. But we're talking about stuff like politicising the courts and governments handing out contracts to their friends to make them rich, all the kind of stuff that we've been seeing in Hungary. And so is this the mechanism that's been used to try and stop Hungary getting this 7.5 billion? Yeah, exactly. Uh, This whole thing might sound kind of familiar because the EU actually announced that it was triggering this mechanism against Hungary back in April. But the specific proposal to freeze 7.5 billion, that is what's new. And it's a big deal because Hungary's economy is not great right now. Uh, we talked in an episode back in June with the journalist Victoria Scherdut about how Orban has relied on cheap energy to stay popular. 
those energy prices are now really under pressure, the same as everywhere else in Europe. So his government needs money for stuff. And this is a really big chunk of cash that the EU might stop Hungary from getting. It's about 5% of Hungary's GDP. And so just to be clear, we talked a while back about Hungary's COVID recovery fund money being withheld. Is it Mm -hmm. that money we're talking about? Or is this different money? This is different money. Uh, So yeah, as you say, there are already billions of euros of EU cash that are supposed to be going to Hungary for the kind of post-COVID economic recovery. But that money already has a big question mark over it. And it's over the same kind of issues, actually. It's concerns over corruption and the way that government contracts get handed out. But yeah, this is a different pot of money that we're talking about. It's not to do with recovering from COVID. It is money from funds that are supposed to be for helping poorer EU regions catch up with richer ones. And so is this money definitely not going to Hungary or have the EU given Hungary a chance to like improve? and then maybe get it. Yeah, they are getting a chance to do that. So what the EU has said is Hungary needs to make some reforms and we will give them a couple of months to do that. But all the EU national governments are going to vote, probably in December, on whether the situation has improved enough to justify saying to Hungary, yeah, okay, we're satisfied with what you've been doing so far. You can have these 7 billion euros. And is Hungary actually making any reforms that might make it likely that they get that money? Kind of. And it's because of that that the more optimistic EU watchers are like, yeah, maybe this mechanism to encourage good behaviour, maybe it's kind of working. Uh, Hungary has announced a bunch of reforms, both so it can get this money and the COVID rescue money. It's said that it's going to launch a new anti-corruption body. It's going to reform the way that government contracts get handed out, which is a huge thing, by the way. It is an absolute scandal how people close to Orban have got rich from government contracts paid for by EU subsidies. Mm. I'll post an article about that in the show notes. So there are these various anti-corruption reforms going through the Hungarian parliament. Whether anything serious is going to change by the end of the year when the EU votes on this, I mean, I have my doubts as do lots of Hungarian activists, it seems. I mean, Hungary's problems are really deep and institutional and you can't fix these things in like a couple of months. But if you can't fix those things in a couple of months, does that make it likely that the EU will cut off this money then? Well, I'm not sure it does make it more likely, to be honest. Um, So this vote is going to be held by qualified majority in the European Council, which I'm sure you remember means that it's the heads of the national governments who are voting. And for it to pass, you need to secure votes that represent 55% of countries and 65% of the EU population. Now, at least one government has already said, oh yeah, we're going to vote for Hungary on this. Uh, It might not surprise you that this government is Poland. But on the other hand, there are quite a lot of other governments further to the West that are really pissed off by the way that Orban has been taking money for years from the EU while being outrageously anti-European in the way that he talks and the way that he acts. However... Orban has always been a really clever operator. So he knows that he has a bunch of bargaining chips. So over the next couple of months, his negotiators are probably going to go around saying to the other EU governments, well, you know, maybe there's something that you need. Maybe we can be helpful to you in some way Mm. in exchange for you voting for us to get this money in December. It might not be as direct as that, but that seems like something that could happen. One area in which Hungary has a lot of bargaining power is Russia. Uh, It's been pretty sickening, frankly, the behaviour of Orban's government on this front. Hungary has basically been Putin's biggest cheerleader within the EU. And last week, for example, Hungary vetoed a proposal to ask the UN Human Rights Council for a special rapporteur on Russian human rights abuses. And the other EU countries had to find another way of doing it because of this Hungarian veto. So in a roundabout way, Orban might well want to ask for this money to be released, this 7.5 billion and the COVID money, as his kind of unofficial price for Hungary being less obstructive on Russia, so that the EU can be more united and stronger in its support for Ukraine. It's a really frustrating situation. And generally, it doesn't really feel like other EU governments are that interested in having a huge blow up row with Hungary right now because there's so much else going on. You know, there is a war on, there is an energy crisis. So to be honest, even if the EU has been talking tough and threatening to take all this money away, we might just see Hungary bringing in some superficial changes over the next couple of months and then getting the green light to receive all of this money because everyone is too tired and too busy to fight, Uh, which wouldn't really send the right message to other authoritarian governments that are looking to get away with stuff. But here we are. 
maybe I'm looking at it from too pessimistic a perspective. Uh, I'd love to hear everyone else's thoughts on this, especially our listeners in Hungary. Do drop us an email if you have thoughts on it. Uh, hello at europeanspodcast.com. Okay, I will. Not you. Um, you can do something else, though. You can tell us who has had a good week. Well, it's been a good week, potentially, for the people of Brussels after a scheme was launched in which psychiatrists can prescribe a free trip to a museum as a method of treatment for mental health patients. This is so interesting. You know, like, instinctively, it sounds lovely. And I can see how it might be helpful to someone who's not in a good place, like having a reason to take yourself somewhere quiet for some reflection. But is there any like evidence that this does actually help mental health? Well, art therapy is like not a new idea. This is not the first experiment with using art to help people. People have been experiencing art since it's like been around basically with the implicit goal of enriching their lives and in sometimes with an explicit therapeutic goal. It's exactly what the Swiss-British philosopher Alain de Botton has been calling for for a decade now. He wrote this book, Art as Therapy, Exploring oh, yeah. the Therapeutic Potential of Art, and encouraging these elite cultural institutions to welcome people into their halls with the explicit aim of helping them, giving them the opportunity and the space to use these cultural goodies they have on offer as a kind of psychological balm. Now, that might all sound a bit abstract and philosophical, but Actually, the World Health Organization claimed in a report back in 2019 that the arts can play an important role in improving mental health. And they encourage further cross-sectoral collaborations to further explore the possibilities and potential benefits. So this scheme in Brussels is following that train of thought. It is also, for now, just a pilot scheme, so there is no guarantee of success at this stage. But the Alderman for Culture and the local hospital they are collaborating with are hoping it will help people and they will be evaluating the success in six months' time. I know for myself, as someone who loves art and loves theatre and culture and works in that field, that uh, it definitely does something to me. Um, does it just make you really stressed? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it makes me really stressed, the process of making art, yes. But uh, when I go and see other people making art, it often makes me feel really good. And it's also a thing that I think people have valued even more since the lockdowns during the pandemic, when it was so much harder to access art outside of one's own house and not through a screen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of why this project is being launched now in response to that. It's also important to know that this museum prescription is not replacing other treatments. It is an additional optional treatment on top of the normal broad selection of therapies on offer, like in medications, exercise, meditation, all those things. And can patients go to like any museum across the city that they choose? Not at the moment. During the pilot phase, it includes five museums, ranging from the City Museum to the Fashion and Lace Museum. Ooh. And uh, rather bizarrely, the Sewer Museum. <laughs> That'd be top of my list. <laughs> I'm really fascinated by like sewers and waste disposal. I know it's a weird thing to say. Oh, really? Oh, well, maybe it does work. Because when I first heard about the fact that the Sewer Museum was on the list, I was like, really, is this going to help anyone? anyone with mental health problems, but maybe <laughs> it sounds like it might help you. And I know depression and mental health problems are complex things and sometimes treated in unusual ways. For example, I know that in terms of music, there are quite a lot of studies done that particularly sad pieces of music or music that we associate with sadness can actually help people sometimes more than happy music. Are you calling the Sewer Museum the museum equivalent of a sad piece of music? Because I think we're <laughs> going to get some complaints from their management. That's true. Um, I have nothing against the sewer museum. I think it's just not my idea of a fun day out. <laughs> Moving on. And the other good thing is that you don't have to go alone. You can bring a friend or even two. Um, I realise that if you're listening from the UK, you may be shocked to hear that people even have to pay for museums. It's one of the few things that the UK actually does really well in terms of culture and heritage, that many of the best museums and galleries are free. But that's not the case in Brussels, apparently. So... Yeah, this prescribed museum visit is quite a bonus. It sounds quite original as an idea. Is this the first time anyone's done this in the world or has it happened somewhere else already? Uh, it's thought to be the first of its type in Europe, but it is inspired by a scheme that has been running in Montreal in Canada since 2018, where psychiatrists can prescribe patients visits to the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. Mm -hmm. And I do all in all think it's a very nice idea. And I'm sure that for many people, museums and cultural events more broadly can help make them feel 
a bit better or even feel good. I also think it's a heartwarming idea to welcome people into these cultural spaces that can sometimes feel unwelcoming or hard to access, especially for certain parts of society. And I know also that mental health treatment is lacking or underfunded in many, many parts of this continent and further abroad. So I do hope there aren't any politicians looking at this scheme thinking, oh, easy, we don't need to invest in more mental health professionals. Let's just send them to museums because I don't think that is what this scheme is suggesting. I was a little bit worried that everyone would have forgotten this podcast existed while we were away on our summer break. So imagine how much it warmed my little heart uh, when a whole bunch of people signed up to support this show over the past week. Yay! People haven't forgotten about us, Dominic. No, they haven't. Um, We have some new supporters to thank. They are Ashling Phelan, Linny Pesto, Adrian Murphy, Enid Swaggart and Dee Rubio. Do you feel like joining them, having your name read out or not if you don't want to, getting access to our secret Facebook Patreon page and maybe even receiving some personalised voicemail from us if you give us a fiver or more per month, then head to patreon.com forward slash Europeans podcast to find out how to do that. We are hugely grateful for all donations, big and small. But if you want to give us maybe a million euros, that would be especially nice. That would be great. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you in advance. Let us journey back in time to the early years of the internet. It is the turn of the millennium. You and I are children. Um, When I imagine you as a child, Dominic, I I can't imagine that you were one of these kids that was like glued to a computer Mm -hmm. because I guess you were like singing all the time. I was singing a lot. With a little ruff around your neck? I didn't have a ruff around my neck. Oh. But uh, I was singing a lot. And but I did actually sit around and watch my friends play computer games. That was I was that guy. Oh, you grew up in a computer shop. Yeah, I did. So before my parents sold bicycles, they sold PCs. Um, so yeah, I was quite glued to the internet from an early age. We had one of those massive tower computers in our house, and I was very addicted to MSN Messenger. So I would log on straight after school to talk to my friends and even people that I didn't know sometimes. Um, and I built a couple of websites on GeoCities. Remember GeoCities? No. Oh, weren't cool enough. <laughs> too busy in your child's job as a singer. Um, And I also had a MySpace page where I used to spend hours like changing the layout and the background music. Mm. So it was a really fun and weird time to grow up, uh, this time when no one quite knew what the internet was exactly. And as such, the new book Escape by the French Moroccan journalist Marie Leconte Lots of it really resonated with me. Uh, It's kind of a memoir of Marie's own experience growing up online, but it's more broadly a book about how the internet has changed over the past 20 years and how it's changed us. I think it's fair to say that Marie is a very online person, much more online than you or me, Dominic, but a lot of the book struck a chord with me, uh, especially the way that she writes about how our friendships have been changed by the internet. It's a really thoughtful book. Marie is also one of the funniest people on my timeline. We've been wanting to get her on the show for ages, so we're really glad to give her a ring this week in London. We're here to talk about your book, but before we get into that, you are a French-born person living in Britain, so you're kind of the reverse of me. I'm a British-born person living in France. I found it really strange this week watching all of these people queuing to see uh, the Queen in a box. Like it made me feel like weirdly disconnected with my home country. Like what has that been like for you in reverse? Do you feel like you've unlocked some knowledge about Britishness that you didn't have before? Already know. Um, So actually, so I've had a slightly weird experience with the queue, as we call it, as we call her. And then on Thursday morning, I woke up and uh, this magazine, The New Statesman, sent me an email saying, oh, do you want to, do you fancy going down and interviewing people in the queue? My first thought was, oh, God. But then I was that fine, actually, you know, I need the money, so I'm actually going to do this, fine. And I just had a really nice time in a way that's quite hard to explain. So I was expecting, to be blunt, I was expecting there to just be a lot of nutters. And actually, it was so many, that I had so many touching and lovely and unexpected conversations. And I think... There was a point where I think the queue became more about the queue than it was about the queen, which was, I think, oddly touching and very human as well, of clearly that need to, A, do something when, you know, you kind of 
get hit sideways by grief and you feel like you've got to do something with yourself, but also that very human need, I think, to be surrounded with people. So yes, I am weirdly, to my genuine surprise, very pro Q. That's really heartwarming and lovely. And yeah, that's the best explanation of it I've heard yet. But moving on to what we've actually invited you here to talk about, uh, we wanted to talk to you about the internet. And you've had a pretty large following online since you were a teenager. How did you get so good at the internet? Oh, I have no idea. And it's always quite awkward because over the years, I've had some people, some especially media companies, trying to hire me to do their social media for them because uh, they kind of assumed I'd be good at that. And I've basically had to say, actually, I have no idea what I'm doing. And that's in many ways the theme of the book, right? It's completely a second nature for me in that I've never known anything but the internet. So I started my first blog when I was 12. I am happy to admit it was not a good blog, but I kind of got used to writing everything online in a way that was, I think, quite sincere and, and adapted, I think, to the medium from a very young age. And then I think there's also just quite the happy coincidence that the other thing I've always liked is writing. So I I think about six, my grand plan for work uh, when I was a grown up was to be a writer at night and then a goat herder during the day, <laughs> which, you know, sure, why not? How do you think your experience of growing up on the internet was different from the way that kids grow up with the internet today? Uh, so I was born in 1991. And I think at the time, being very online, so, you know, being kind of 13, 14 and my age, it was very much an active decision that you had to make. And it was still actively quite weird to be online. So lots of my friends were not. So even when I was actually 15, 16, 17, and that's when I kind of became a medium deal, I would say, in the music blogging scene in France. Most of my classmates had no idea because even then, you know, what they do was at most a bit of MSN Messenger, a bit of Facebook, and that was kind of it. It still felt as well. I think that's the other massive different thing. It felt like a different world. Also from a very boring sort of like technological point in that you had to go on the computer. So I had a computer in my bedroom from quite a young age because my dad's a massive nerd. But, you know, fundamentally, I had my life in the computer and then I would leave that and I would go to school. I would go meet my friends, etc. And that was real life. And that was separate from what was going on online. And I think that dividing line just no longer exists in the same way at all. So if you grew up 10 years younger than me, A, you've never known anything but the internet. B, I don't think you've ever known what quote unquote real life was without the internet and vice versa. And do you think we are therefore, I mean, I'm kind of the same generation of you as is Katie. Do you think we're kind of lucky to have been born at that time when the internet was starting to become a thing and growing up alongside the internet? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I think that that's kind of the question the book probably should have answered, but actually I'm not convinced I definitely have the answer to it. I personally feel lucky in that I think things have gone really right for me. The internet has helped me have, you know, a life I couldn't have dreamt of having when I was a kid growing up in a sort of mid-sized city in France. But at the same time, you know, I, I do feel slightly... So when I talk to people who are just that bit older, kind of born in the late 70s, early 80s, that kind of vibe where it nearly feels like they had the best of both worlds in that, you know, they had their whole teenage years offline effectively. And then, you know, the internet still became a fun place to be when they were in their 20s, late 20s, etc. And that does maybe strike me as the best possible deal because there's still a picture taken by my best friend at the time of me at the age of 12, like in my mum's bed, pulling a silly face that's just on the blog that exists and that's in the world and I can't do anything about that. I have like a really similar thing that if you google me like the fifth photo is a photo of me when I was 10 and like <laughs> why is that still there and why, why can't we change that? And then the third photo of you is a, a very sort of moody posy portrait of you Dominic which I love very much and Thank everyone you. should uh, <laughs> google right now. Thank you I feel um, very embarrassed. I'm, I'm curious were there any differences between like the French speaking early internet and the English speaking early internet? Hmm. I think that one's quite a difficult one to answer because I was actually from quite a young age, one of those very tragic kids who was obsessed with Britain and with the US because I became really obsessed when I was 13 with guitar music and the kind of, you know, landfill indie movement, as we call it now, I think. So all the kind of very pasty white British boys with guitars, you know, that was really my jam. I wonder if it's not also a slight generational thing where actually it maybe took young French people that bit longer to actually create spaces that felt fun and compelling and cool, etc. Um, and so maybe people who were born five years after me got to have a really, really good time online on quote unquote, the French internet. But that was not my experience, I think, at the time, you know, in the kind of very late 90s, early 2000s, there was not as much, I think, as a 
French online sphere that felt compelling as a teenager. If you were able to bring back anything from the earlier internet compared to the internet of today, what would you want to bring back? I love blogs. I miss blogs so much. And actually, so I interviewed quite a lot of people for the book. And genuinely, I would say upwards of like 30 or 40% of the people I interviewed, without even me asking that specific question, at some point said, oh my God, I miss blogs so much. But I also really miss sort of everything they meant, I guess, of, and God, I'm going to sound like the worst of like, your grumpy uncle. Um, But I sort of miss the time when people were writing online for the sake of writing online because they wanted to share like, you know, a stupid thing that happened to them or a useful tip they learned or whatever else. And without having that layer of, oh, you know, I may get super famous or I may get a brand partnership or become an influencer, whatever. It was very much, I feel like blogging 10, 15 years ago, very much felt like people were doing it for its own sake and were kind of creating scenes as well. You know, you'd read a blog and then you'd leave a comment saying, hello, I have a blog as well. And then the other person would read your blog. And if you got along, then, you know, you'd kind of become friends through that, etc. A lot of what we read today about the internet is super depressing. It is about how the internet spreads hate speech and conspiracy theories and turns men into incels. So it was really nice to read a book that like celebrates the internet's potential for spreading joy and helping people to find other people who are like them. Obviously, there is lots of terrible things about the internet. But why do you think the joyful side tends to get mm, not talked about so much? Is it maybe that there is actually, A, like there is less joy now online than there used to be. B, I wonder if it's not a basic sort of like human psyche thing of, you know, and I find that obviously not Everyone will be able to relate to that, but I'm sure everyone's got their own version of that. But, you know, if I write a piece and then there are sort of like 12 comments saying, oh, great piece, really enjoyed that. But then two comments saying, actually, that was rubbish or I feel like I didn't learn anything. It was badly written. Guess what? When I'm going to bed that night at 1 a.m. lying in the dark, what I'm going to be thinking about is not the 12 nice comments. It's going to be the two rubbish comments Mm -hmm. because that's just how we work um, as people, I think. So I think there's partly that as well of the unpleasant experiences will probably stick to the minds of people online more than the pleasant ones. And I don't know, so I, I wonder as well if it may be a question of the atmosphere online is quite bad. So you may be able to have individual experiences that are very sort of like surprising and pleasant and fun, etc. But there's still the kind of overarching aura of like stress and paranoia and malevolence and whatever being online now, you know, in the way that even if I tweet a stupid thing now, and it mostly gets a good response from people who think it's funny or whatever, a small part of my brain at all times will still be like, okay, will someone find an angle to cancel me for this? So I wonder if it's the overall atmosphere of the internet is less joyful than it used to be. As someone who is so prominent on the internet, sometimes, obviously, you get a lot of criticism. And does it ever feel like it's not worth it? Does it ever feel like you want to step away from it? Uh, Sometimes. So I did... So I think one generally quite big moment online for me, which I know is going to sound mad, was in 2020 when, very long story short, I posted a thing which I thought was fun and then people decided to cancel me for it. And basically I sort of snapped. And also, I mean, what helped, I think, was that it was lockdown, so I had the time to do it. And I basically individually messaged about the 800 or so people I interacted with the most on my Twitter account. And I was like, follow me on this new locked account because actually I can't really take this anymore. And, you know, and A, for quite a long time after that, I barely posted on my public account. I kind of stopped. Obviously, one side of me is like, you know, don't let the haters win because that's exactly what they want you to do, right? You know, what they want you to do is post less and be less prominent online. But also I have like, this has now made me very anxious and unhappy. You know, what a pyrrhic victory that is of like, yay, I'm staying. I'm not letting the haters win. But actually that's turning me into an anxious mess, um, which is how I kind of made that decision. So yes, I would say it's it's a fine balance overall, which I'm not sure everyone always gets right. Marie's book is called Escape, How a Generation Shaped, Destroyed and Survived the Internet. It is out now. Uh, One thing I really liked about it is that it celebrates the early internet as a place where young women could express themselves. Mm. And it made a really nice change reading about that instead of the side of the internet that's like 
occupied by male internet trolls. Uh, I really enjoyed that side of things. Uh, so go and read it. And if you aren't following Marie on Twitter, where have you been? She is there at Young Vulgarian. Isolation Inspiration Time. What have you been enjoying this week? I wanted to recommend a newsletter that I've been enjoying reading over the past few weeks in the run up to the pretty important election that's taking place this coming weekend in Italy. A pretty scary election to engage with, frankly, considering it's seeming pretty likely that Italy will be run by Giorgia Meloni following the election, a politician from a party with fascist roots. But uh, engage with this election I have mainly via a newsletter called Politalia, which has been really helping me understand what's going on in Italy in the run-up to the election mm. and why the right-wing bloc seem to be doing so well. It's full of sharp analysis, all from Laura Galante, an Italian who works at the Democratic Society, and it's free to subscribe to, so I'll put a link in the show notes and hopefully she'll help us understand what happens this weekend. Nice. I will definitely check that out. What have you been enjoying? Uh, this week I watched and really enjoyed the Danish film Druk. It's called Another Round in English. Have you seen it or heard of it? Oh, I've really wanted to see it. It's like on my to watch list. Yeah, it's a couple of years old now. Uh, it came out in 2020 and it won an Oscar for Best International Feature Film. It stars the great Mads Mikkelsen. So that is reason enough to watch it, frankly. But it's a film about four quite unhappy teachers at a Danish high school who decide to test out the theory that humans would be happier if they were a tiny bit drunk all the time. <laughs> It is a comedy, and I remember thinking when I first heard about it, like, eh, is this just going to be a kind of wacky comedy about how funny it would be if people were a bit drunk at work? And I was worried that it wasn't going to deal at all with the problematic side of alcohol. Uh, without wanting to give you any spoilers, I think it deals really well with a country's complicated relationship with alcohol. Both are something that can, you know, give people the confidence to be more open with their emotions. And let's face it, lots of us enjoy it a lot of the time but also is something that can be incredibly socially destructive. Uh, I've been thinking about this film all week. I really liked it a lot. It is also quite an eye-opener into the teenage drinking culture in Denmark. Like, I thought that the drinking culture that I grew up with in the UK was pretty bad. And now after watching this film, I feel like that was pretty mild. Uh, apparently Danish teenagers drink more than any other teenagers in Europe, mm. according to the World Health Organization. Uh, but yeah, I'd be fascinated to hear more about that. If any Danish listeners want to get in touch with their experiences during their teen years, uh, do drop us a message. Uh, but yeah, I really recommend this film. Mads Mikkelsen is excellent in it. The whole cast is, I think. And uh, yeah, wherever you are, it should be available on one streaming platform or another. Truk or another round. I've got a life-affirming happy ending for you this week, and it comes from France, where a climber known as the French Spider-Man has completed an epic climb to the top of the 48-storey Total Energies skyscraper in Paris at the age of 60. He climbed completely free without any ropes and made it to the top in just an hour, 60 minutes. He had actually climbed the building a few times before, but wanted to do it again to mark his milestone birthday of 60 years old. And he gave a nice quote to Reuters, uh, which is, I want to send people the message that being 60 years old is nothing. You can still do sport, be active, do fabulous things. You say this is a life-affirming story, but... There is nothing I find more horrifying than the prospect of climbing up a skyscraper with no, like, safety ropes. Oh, you're absolutely right. And what he did was totally illegal. And he was apparently arrested when he reached the top oh, of the building. <laughs> but hey, he knows what he's doing. And he's been arrested numerous times before. It's definitely not my kind of birthday outing. But I do find it quite impressive that he can do this crazy climbing at any age. Yeah, I'm going to leave that kind of birthday celebration to the professionals and uh, go to the pub for my next birthday. That is it for this week. We'll be back in your ears next week with more of the stories from around Europe uh, that tend to get buried in the avalanche of news. We'll see you then. Uh, in the meantime, where can people find us on the internet, Dominic? They can find us on Instagram at Europeans Podcast. Yeah. 
<laughs> yes, well done. I think I know by now. On Twitter at Europeans Pod. Uh, you can also check out our website, europeanspodcast.com. It's not exactly social media, but who cares? It's the internet. Marie has taught us many things this week. Uh, the show is produced this week by me and Wojciech Alexiak. Our other producer, Katz Laszlo, is working on some exciting forthcoming episodes. And we are part of the Are We Europe audio family. You can find more continental content for your ears at the link in the show notes. And maybe it's worth also announcing that we were nominated for a really exciting prize along with Are We Europe. Yay! Our visual episode of Josh and Franco was nominated for the pre-Europa in the category of digital media project. And just want to send huge congratulations to Eddie Stock, the visual designer, and Katz Laszlo and Josh Prezioso, who co-produced the audio episode. If you are a Spotify user, you can actually watch that beautiful animation right within the app there. It's way cool. Uh, so go and do that this week. Do it while you're waiting for our episode. Next week, we'll be back on Thursday as usual. Till then, au revoir. See you then. Vislat. Bye.